I'm happy to be here. Uh, I know some of you. Hi, friends. And those who I don't know, hi here, too. We are going to talk about uh, writing romance without choking on the cheese. I should be excellent at writing romance because kiss was the very first word I ever wrote. When I was little, and this is actually a total real memory, I was about three, and I loved, I always loved writing. I bet a lot of you are that way too. And when I was little, I would take a stack of papers, and I'd bend them in half, and then I'd use about 29 staples on the one side, and I'd get my big crayon, and I would just string letters together because I knew my letters, but I didn't know how to write. And I remember one night going into my mom in the kitchen and showing, I said, hey, mom, here's my book I wrote. And like a good mom, she sat down and would thumb through it. And I remember the night she thumbed through it. She said, hey, you really wrote a word. And I said, cool, what is it? She said, it's the word kiss. And my five older brothers older overheard this. And they started to torment me. <gasps> You know, making the whole kissing noise thing and telling me maybe I was going to kiss the neighbor boy. And when you're three, that's like the worst thing you've ever heard, especially from your older brothers. I would go to my room sobbing and uh, literally, I, totally, totally traumatized. I think that was the last romantic thing I ever wrote for 35 more years. <laughs> I, I, I swore off of it. And when I sat down to write, um, it's, it's not definitely a romance novel. Cycles is not. But almost every book needs a little romance, right? When I went down to, when I sat down to write this particular, this particular scene that's kind of romantic, I realized I don't know what I'm doing. And so I had to study how to do it. And that's what this class is about, what I learned. So writing romance can be painful. I felt like the person in this video, this is from BYU, Studio C. Don't know if you've ever seen them. <laughs> There's can feel like that, right? It can be kind of tricky to write, and it can sometimes be, uh, maybe feel a little moldy, like you're kind of regurgitating something. Have you ever tasted moldy romance? What made it taste bad? Can someone tell me something? Don't name the book, but um, 
maybe just generally, what made a romance scene taste bad? Great. She's going to give you the audio. Oh, um, I was just going to say it was like really, really sappy, like too much. Too much romance. Okay, excellent. Let's have maybe another comment right over here. Okay, yes, there and then the gentleman in the white shirt. It seemed like they got into it way too fast and they we didn't get a really full of connection for it. They didn't build it up. That's excellent. We're going to talk about that. Great point. Me too. I'm with you. They said it was like they were falling in love. So cliche. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You guys are, well, thank you for coming. Um, we have, <laughs> You guys told my class. <laughs> You're awesome. So we're going to talk about ways to make the romance in your writing stay fresh. First of all, uh, let me ask you, before the romance comes the characters. The romance has no meaning unless you have developed the characters the way you want to develop them. So here I have a, the first way to make your, your romance stay fresh. Perfect people make boring characters. I took my example from The Sound of Music. We have Maria, who's immature, insecure, has really, really ugly clothes. Now, by the end of the movie, is she any of those things? No. She, she has a great character arc. And by the end of the movie, she's a lot more confident, and her maturity level has soared. Okay, we have Captain Von Trapp. In the beginning, he's arrogant, unkind, grumpy, and worst of all, he's kind of old. Ooh. Okay, he stays old through the whole movie, but... He, he, the other parts, you see a kind side to him. You, re you recognize how loyal he is to his children and then eventually to Maria. So huge, huge character arcs. In the beginning, they are not perfect people. And that makes the romance so much more meaningful by the end. Here's another character who's definitely not perfect, yet we love the romance. This guy smells, burps, he's rude, he's bad-tempered, he farts, he's got a big nose, yellow teeth, and he's green. And yet, who likes Shrek? I mean, and who is totally rooting for him and Fiona at the very end of that, and the glass breaks, and it's like epic, okay? You don't need to make gorgeous, perfect characters to make your romance good. In fact, it's best if you give them some flaws. Number two, way to make your romance fresh, create tension from the start. In the beginning, there has to be challenges preventing your characters from having the relationship they want. Regardless what you think of the Twilight series, she has done a fabulous job in the first book. She does a fabulous job creating tension. Okay, let me read this because I want to read it because I want it exactly right. The str as str okay, let me phrase it this way. The stronger the wall is between your romance, the characters you want in the romance, so the stronger the wall is, the better the romance will be. All right, so Bella and Ella, or Bella, <laughs> sorry. I have a daughter named Ella, that <laughs> came out weird. Bella and Edward, raise your hand if you can tell me what the wall is between them. Let's see, um, do we have someone on, who can, who can answer that? Uh, right in there, thanks Laura, you choose. <laughs> He's a vampire. He's a vampire, and because of that fact, if they get together, he can kill her. That's a pretty intense wall. Your life's on the line if you like this guy. She did a great job making a wall. Your, oh, here we go. Your character's romance can only be as strong as the wall keeping them apart. So what I want you to do, we're going to go a few slides, and I want you to write down what you think the wall is keeping these characters apart. And then, you know what? Write it down, and then we'll answer it right then so we don't have to flip back to the different slides. A Cinderella story. Raise your hand. If you want to tell Laura, or if you want Laura to give you the mic, um, who, who knows the wall between the two characters in Cinderella's story? They don't know each other, like they haven't ever met. Excellent. Anything else? There's another wall. And multiple walls are good, too. She's going to come over to the top. You guys have to talk into the microphone so the camera can get you. The popularity factor? Yeah. Um, and, and maybe I would add to that um, the evil stepmother, right? And she, she has decided Cinderella is not popular. She wants her daughters to be popular. So there's two walls. Now, is Cinderella the most intense love story you've ever read? Do you know why? It's a cute story. It's a fairy tale. 
but those aren't really enormous walls, are they? But it still works. There's still walls. And, you know, the, the story isn't meant to be necessarily a, a, a huge love story. Anyone familiar with this movie? It's called Ghost. Raise your hand. It's an oldie but a goodie. Um, I'll briefly tell the plot if you guys don't know. There's a man. He works for a bank. He knows all these amazing codes so he can get into people's accounts. Bad people know he knows those codes. And they kill him. And his girlfriend does not die. And so now the bad people are after her. Well, he comes back as a ghost to, to, to protect her. And the romance kind of continues as him as a ghost. What's the wall? He's a ghost. Exactly. He's dead. Um, that one is a stronger love story. Got to be honest. It's a good, it's a good, good wall. Romeo and Juliet. Raise your hand if you know the wall. Yes. Feuding families. Feuding families for years and years. Now, um, the feud is br brutal. And that brutality of this feud makes it so much more, that wall really intense. And how is Romeo and Juliet as a love story? It's pretty great. Yeah. Well, good point. Here we go. This one is, um, now I want you to look. This, this romance is not between Marius and Cosette. I want to know what the wall is between Marius and Ep Eponine. Right here. Would you mind grabbing her, Laura? Well, the wall is kind of Cosette and that he doesn't love her. Exactly. Marius doesn't love, I'm going to say her name wrong, Eponine. Um, but who in here, when Eponine dies in Marius's arms, who cried? Oh, guys, raise your hand. <laughs> You're the man right there in the hat. Why did you cry? Do you mind uh, taking that mic over and letting him answer why? Why did you why did you cry, or at least why did you raise your hand that you cried? What, what, what was impactful to you about that scene? The fact that even though she, he didn't love her, he still held her in his arms when he died. Yeah. My personal opinion is if she hadn't died, maybe they would have gotten together, because maybe he realized at that moment. They had a much stronger, I know, you guys probably like Cosette, but I don't really like her all as much as, as Eponine. She has a stronger character. And a little bit like how Romeo and Juliet, the relationship was really brief. So is um, Marius's and Cosette's. And Eponine's actually a, a little bit of a longer relationship, which I think is why it was so impactful when she dies. All right. One thing to watch out for, the silly big misunderstanding. If the silly big misunderstanding is the wall that you have built between your characters, it might be slightly weak. Now, oftentimes, the silly, the silly big misunderstanding happens in the beginning of a relationship. And that's great. But it needs to grow into something else, stronger. Like if your whole book, John doesn't know that Mary likes him, and Mary just doesn't think John likes her because once he stared at her kind of rudely, and that's what is the entire driving force between them not getting together, it's just not going to make as powerful as a romance. So watch out for that. All right, number three, ways to keep your romance fresh. Make it more than just physical attraction. Now, some of you are going to go to the, the script writing class, maybe, so don't tell them I said this, but movies can get away with having a romance based solely on looks, but books can't. Granted, movies that don't just base them on looks are usually stronger and more powerful, but they do get away with it because um, you look at a good-looking guy or a good-looking girl, and you're kind of already rooting for that character. Um, readers must love your characters for other reasons, such as... Princess Bride, Buttercup and Wesley. What does Wesley do that makes you just love him? Raise your hand. What does he do? Oh, actually, I've already wrote the answer, didn't I? Sorry. The sacrifice, as you wish, right? And then he takes off to, to try to be able to eventually come back and marry her. I'm kind of blocking that way. Sorry. Okay, friendship. This took like seven years to build. Okay, I had like a grimace over here. I got to admit, this isn't my favorite romance. Is that why you grimace? It's not my, it's not my favorite romance, but it is a sweet one because they are friends first. And that's, that's kind of original. A lot of times in books, we don't get that. How about this? What if the characters face unconquerable odds together? That's going to bring, that's going to build their character. You're going to fall in love with them regardless of their looks. And this is from Pirates of the Caribbean, Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan. And then if your character has an all-around goodness to them, like Spider-Man, Superman, um, that's going to also help your reader fall in love. But just remember, they need a flaw. 
Don't make them a perfect character because perfect people make boring characters, okay? All right, number four, rewrite dorky cliches. Cliches. All right, I want to ask you guys, have you noticed, this is what I have found in, in life. I have found it ironic that the dorkiest characters say the most clever things and the most good-looking characters say the dumbest things. And that's a bummer. The perfect scenario would be if you had a not-so-dorky character, though dorky characters are great. They're usually my favorite in the whole book. But anyway, um, and if you just, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you do have a character that's not dorky, watch out by making him too cool sounding because it, it gets it gets kind of dull, flat. So I love Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Rowley there says the funnest things. Uh, Zoe Mama, it's just clever. It's not your usually, I mean, it's not your usual, hey, good looking or whatever. This is just, it's, it's unique. And, um, and so you love Rowley because he's unique. What are some less clever lines that we see sometimes in romance? Raise your hand if you know a less clever line that you have read. What, what are some cliches you might, you might read in a, in a romance book? Okay, we've got one up here. What else is there? <laughs> Good. Anyone else got an idea? I fell in love at first sight. Oh, that's great. I fell in love at first sight. Let's try one more. It was only you at the beginning. <laughs> Very good. I came up with some that I, th that I thought were rather cliche. Here is, you stole my heart. We're soulmates. There's no one else like you. The kiss was magical. Um, y you've probably read at least variations of these lines, okay? And there's nothing wrong with them per se, but you can make them stronger and better. And the stronger your dialogue is between your two characters who are falling in love, the stronger the romance is going to be. you have a question? Laura? I was just wondering with um, some romances, even though there's cliches, does trauma help the cliche? Like if somebody comes out as a cliche, can the trauma kind of fix it or make it better? What do you mean by trauma? Like almost dying or in... Um, they're just after an accident, like say someone rescued the lover from the fire and they're just out by themselves. And you know what? I totally agree with you. And I'll tell you why I agree with you. Because if you're writing and it's something dangerous, traumatic, and they've just come together, they're not going to say something witty because they're coming. I mean, you're just going to say what comes out. In fact, in one of my books, I'm thinking about it, and that's exactly what I did. I think she says something like, um, I knew you'd come, which is kind of, you know, a little bit, but, but uh, yeah. But I'm with you, because she wouldn't at that point all of a sudden say, zowie mama, you know, you're absolutely right. So excellent point. I appreciate that. Very good. So we're going to look at rewriting some of these cliches. So steps to reconstructing cliche phrases. And if you don't want to write these down, they will be on the Internet during, you can watch it on the on-demand classes. Um, ways to reconstruct. Think of cliches simply as placeholders. You're writing and you're writing fast, you're doing, you're, you know, you're just, oh, you've got this creative something going on, and you're writing, and all of a sudden you get to a romantic line. It is perfectly fine. In fact, it's great to put a cliche in as a placeholder. Just put a note in your brain that I'll probably come back and rewrite that a little bit. But that way you can just keep going, because to come up with maybe a clever little saying or, or to think of something unique um, might pull you away from your creative euphoria you're in. I don't know. So go ahead and use cliches. Use them as placeholders. What do you really want to say? When you go back to that cliche, ask yourself, what do I really want to say? Do I really want to say we're soulmates? Or do I, okay, so for example, let's say you're writing a book about motorcycling and like your, your main characters love motorcycles. So instead of saying we're soulmates, what are you really trying to say? Well, maybe the girl is saying, she's saying, hey, the first time I, wanna, I went on a bike ride with you was, was um, you know, like the best day of my life or something. It's not all that clever. It's actually plain language. And um, just plain language is, is actually really good because that's how, we, that's how we speak. 
Um, one thing, do you need the expression at all? So if you've got kind of a, a romantic cliche in there, do you want to just take it out? Do you want to just rewrite it in plain language? Do you really need an expression? Sometimes an expression is great, and that's when you have to really put on your thinking caps and kind of come up with a, a unique way to say something. And then, of course, rewrite it using an unusual simile, just plain language, or an analogy that fits with the story's elements. All right, so I have um, in one, in a, it was the this is the sequel to my book Cycles, and um, she's in a zoology class, and, and a lot happens in the zoology class. And this is a little my attempt at rewriting the cliche: the kiss was magical. This is what I wrote instead. This was it, the real thing. This was going to be her first kiss, and she was about to share it with a gutted worm, dead beetles, and an oozing grasshopper because she's in a zoology lab with um, the boy. So that's my attempt to try to avoid a cliche in, in a scene. OK, number five, and someone already said this. Take it slow. I personally can't stand a book, though there are times it's fine, when they're kissing by the second chapter. Uh, now, sometimes they do that, and then they get torn apart and then it takes the whole book to get back together, and I think that works. But if they're already together by chapter two and they stay together for the rest of the 250 pages, it loses its umph. It's like, well, you know, they're together. So you need to take it slowly. I, and I find this in movies a lot, too, in television shows. Um, the ones that are the most successful don't have people like the main characters don't like each other after the third episode. It like literally the whole season goes and then like the last fin and the finale, like they kind of get together. And then you gotta wait for the second season to see if they really did get together. But um, take it slow. This is really, I find this really interesting. This is actually from as studies done from like sociologists and psychologists. And these are steps of intimacy, I guess is what we would call it. So now, so when you're writing a book, these, aren't, these are kind of good hints to you of how to build a relationship. Now, by no means should you go 1 through 13 and follow this you know, exact format. That's not what I'm saying. But these are kind of good to look at and think, OK, how could I work that into my novel? So number one, there is always summing up the person. This is the first glance. And this is through the eyes of the protagonist. Whether you're writing in third person or first person, the protagonist is going to see his or her love interest and sum them up. They haven't talked, he knows, and she knows nothing about the other person, but they're going to sum up. Then there's typically a look in the eye. Now, that doesn't mean you need to write, they stared into one another's eyes. <laughs> but somehow you convey that they looked at each other. Because the sum up doesn't mean they're looking at each other. It means that she notices him from across the room. But he might not know that she's there or, um, or vice versa. Whoops, I think I died. Oh, nope, I'm good. All right, a look in the eye. Number three, they speak to each other. What are their first words? Yes, we have a question. It's not totally irrelevant, but how do you write something that's an existing romance? Like if it's between a husband and wife, do you still follow this? Are they apart or are they separate? What do you mean? Separate like, are they, are they in a fight? Or are they totally in love in the beginning chapter? No, I mean like a married couple that's happy. How do you write that? They're just side characters, but how do you already write their romance? I wouldn't focus on it. If they're side characters, mm -hmm. they're in love. And you could do some cute banter between them that shows they're in love. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how, you know, maybe he slaps her bum. I don't know. No, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but definitely you can show it, but you're not worried about the wall, the, the tension wall. And you're not worried. If they're already married, then they've already gone through this whole rigmarole. So um, I wouldn't worry about it. Show some cute banter. Show some, show, show some cute scenes. This is typically between your two main characters and typically between two people that aren't together yet. Okay, good question. Thank you. All right. Um, they speak to each other. Then a hand touches the arm or shoulder. Okay, you do not need to write arm or shoulder. It may be the elbow. I don't know. To be honest, the very first time my husband and I... Uh, like touched. Oh, by the way, this is called crossing the boundary. Okay, so I distinctly remember dating my husband, 
and we're watching a, a video in my in my basement, and we were kind of next to each other. And I remember, like, we had our, you know, it, we were in our basement, so our, our shoes were off. That's right. So he's in his socks, and I'm in my socks. And we hadn't held hands or anything yet. And his foot touched my foot. <laughs> Gross, huh? I mean, now I, like, avoid the man's feet. Okay. But at that moment, I remember thinking... Zowie mama. I mean, I really do. I was just like, this is so exciting. So, okay, you know, different kind of touches work, but something like a hand, a hand might touch the foot. Ooh, anyway, um, that's crossing the boundary. And then would come holding hands. And you don't have to include all these again in your book. Maybe you pick and choose, right? Um, an arm over the shoulder is more intimate than holding hands. I don't know if I totally agree with that with a psychologist. I kind of think you could maybe swap those, to be honest. But that's just my opinion. We're going with the, with the experts here. Okay, next, an arm around the waist. And I, I agree with that. Okay, we've got a hug. We've got a kiss on the cheek. More intimate than a kiss on the cheek is a hand touching the back. Who would agree with that? Anyone? The girls are like, yeah, and the boys are like, well, I don't know. But anyway, it's true. Um, this may be done in like a smooth way, maybe at a dance, or maybe he's protecting her from danger. And this is usually the boy touching the girl on the back. It's not that exciting when the girl touches the boy on the back. Um, so, you know, protecting her from danger, which makes a great scene. If you can combine a danger scene with romance, You've got so many emotions going. So next, hand touches the cheek or the head. And I'm going to ask you why you think that. Twelve is an actual kiss, lip to lip. <laughs> and then we have 13, which is the hand touches the neck, which is more intimate than a kiss. Raise your hand if you have any idea why you think that is. Who's got a thought? There's one right there, Laura. Because, like, a kiss is just normal. It's something people all do all the time. But, like, when, like, you touch the neck, it's more subconscious. Mm -hmm. And so you're not actually forcing yourself to, like, kiss that person. Yeah. You're doing it because you like them. And is there anything more vulnerable to have touched than your neck? I mean, if you didn't trust the person, if you did not know a person, like, if I go to you, ah, hi, let me grab you around the neck. You know, I mean, like, no, thank you. Right? It, it really gives you a level of, I trust you. And so interestingly enough, uh, that is more intimate than a kiss. And that is where I am going to stop because I have no desire to continue on the ladder of intimacy after that. Okay? You can talk to your parents about that if you want to go All right. This is my favorite movie slash television show currently. I may get another one soon. But anyway, North and South, it's a BBC, BBC miniseries. Of course, before that, it was a book, right? It's a Regency um, romance. And this miniseries is five hours long. Okay. Anyone who has seen it, when does the kiss happen? Here we go. Five hours long. When does it happen? Like in the last 10 minutes of the movie? Yeah, it's actually in the last four. Okay? So we have just survived 300 minutes to get to the last four, and it works. And it works because they've done all of these steps. The characters are not perfect. They, um, there's, a pretty, there's, a, there's a wall between them. They, uh, you know, it's cute English accents, so anything they say won't be cliche or dorky. <laughs> Um, and and they, t they take it slow. Okay, so I am going to show you just the last blip. I would love to show you all five minutes of it, but um, we don't have time. Set the stage. He is going, okay, north and south, obviously. He lives in the north. She lived in the south. She came up to the north, met him. Then she left back down to the south. They didn't get together. At the very end of the movie, he goes down to the south to try to find her. She goes up to the north to try to find him. And then the last four minutes, they meet in the middle on a train. Um, train, what is it called? In Harry Potter platform. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I had to think of the Harry Potter word for that. Here we go. Oh, how come I didn't play? Oh, I thought I'm going to do it at the end. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's okay. It'll be at the end. I remember now. Okay, now that the characters are kissing, sorry, just we will catch up to the north and south blip. What do I talk about? Never just the kiss. Honestly, your readers do not want to know if the boy's lips were chappy. 
If the girl had a little bit of extra spit in the corner of her mouth, it doesn't make for, that's not, that's not what we want to hear about. Um, so yeah, you, you talk about the kiss, maybe you mention the lips briefly, but there are so many other things you can incorporate into a kiss scene. There is dialogue, talking between the two characters. This is where you, you need to avoid the cliche stuff, but also where we can really put in some fun talk and, and make it strong. Um, oh, no, I'm going to do that. I don't want to get there yet. So sorry. Then we've got thoughts. These are internal thoughts. And this is probably where most of your um, prose will happen when you're writing a romance scene. It's going to be some internal thought. You know, she's going to, like, the example I gave you from Spaces, that was her internal thought. You know, this was it. This was the real thing, and she was going to share it with a dead beetle, blah, blah, blah. That's internal dialogue. Okay, humor. Add a little humor. Makes it awesome. Again, that's combining emotions. It's combining the romantic emotion and the, the fun laughing emotion. So it makes it strong. Setting. And this is interesting. When um, It's a great tool. When you're writing romance, it's a great time to show that the character is noticing everything around them. Like, like maybe there's a smell. So that she starts kissing or him or her, and I mean the guy like is, starts kissing her, and maybe he smells um, like some bread baking, and that is so like he's just like, oh, I love bread. It smells so good, and the bread smell wafted, it wafted. It. Anyway, so if you can, you probably might notice some of the setting, and it's a good way to talk about the romance scene without having to describe every minutia about the kiss. Can I just mention that that's the second time Leonardo DiCaprio has shown up? In, oh, I know, that's true. Romeo it. and Juliet, too. Yeah, good point. Well, how could he not show up in a romance class? And then danger. And you talked a little bit about this. Danger scenes make awesome romance scenes. And I agree with you totally, going back to your point. The dialogue there might be really short, short and quick. Um, but you're combining two emotions again, and it's, gonna, it's a powerful way. Okay, here we go. This is the last scene to North and South, and then we're actually done with this class. I'm right on time. Here we go. I have some 15,000 pounds. It is lying in the bank at present. I have very little interest. Now, my financial advisors tell me that if you were to take this money and use it to run more Bramels, you could give me a very much better rate of interest. So you see, it is only a business matter. You would not be obliged to me in any way. It is you who would be doing me the service. takes off and he's like, oh my gosh, she's not going to stay with me. And she actually goes tells the other guy that she's, goodbye, see you later. And then they, they ride off in a train together. Thank you so much for coming. May the, oh, I forgot the last slide. And they all lived happily ever after. Have a great day. Enjoy yourself.